we are going to start, as I said, um, with some very specific questions. And okay. um, we're starting with passion. And uh, having looked through some of your manuscripts, um, we're starting with um, the opening number, Clara Giorgio number one. And this is perhaps silly, but one of the things that struck me is you wrote big X there, and it reminded me of Gershwin writing GT for good theme. <laughs> and I'm just wondering if no, how you... No, that usually means that I want that to go with an accompaniment. This is, this is a, a sheet of vocal ideas for Clara and Giorgio, and probably the X, uh, uh, the big means it's to be, play, it's, it's to be the big statement. Mm -hmm. The X probably means that it corresponds with an X someplace else in an accompaniment figure. Or, uh, or an accompaniment, uh, a few bars of accompaniment, mm -hmm. so that I know that I want this to go with that accompaniment uh, uh, figure as opposed to this or this or this or this or this. Each, each of the lines is a separate uh, vocal idea. I separate them, as one does, between staves with little parallel lines. And when I erase it, it means that then it's a continuous theme, usually, although this one, I don't know why, why I put that in there. But um, so... Uh, each line is separate and it only continues if there isn't a, uh, um, a, a, a set of, of, of parallel lines there. Like this uh, looks to me like this first one will go to the second one there. But this is a new idea. I sketch in little words uh, just uh, which come from the lyric sheets to remind myself that this theme is for that particular a set of lyrics, etc., 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 etc. If you're working on the same section, why would you, you suddenly do a key change? Oh, oh the, um, the same I probably have outlined a harmonic scheme someplace else, and um, sometimes I change uh, because I change. I realize that it's going out of out of a vocal register that, that, that or it's something that's awkward. Like suddenly the melody will get too low. And yet, if it's still within, let's say, an octave in six or an octave in five, something that I think that a singer can can do, uh, I'll leave it in that key. But if it, if the tessitura gets too low or too high, I'll switch the keys around before I get locked in my head into the key that I'm working in. So if I'm writing something in E flat, and uh, I realize the melody is getting too low before it gets too entrenched in an E flatness in my head, I'll take it up to a G G major and I'll rewrite the accompaniment in G major. And uh, or sketch out the accompaniment in G major, and then start um, the, the melodic flow going in G major. Do you always think uh, once you've completed a song and it's in a show, and usually the the key is changed, do you still think in your head of the? Yeah, well, key? I still yes. If, if I'm asked to play it at the piano, I'll play it in 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 the key I wrote in. Often I will write in something that I can sing. And you'll you'll if you'll you'll note probably the manuscripts over the years the keys lower. I used to be able to sing up to an E. Uh, even on a full stomach, and now I cannot get up above a C. I mean, my voice is darker. I can get down a little lower, but I'm essentially a bass baritone. And, um, and so for demonstration purposes, I have to write in something that I can play and sing to, to play to producers, directors, collaborators, etc. Do you et think of different keys as having different... They have, well, uh, there, there are a number of things I feel about keys. Flat keys are easier to, to read and play in, and I don't know why, and that's generally true. You'll find most musicians will say that. Um, and uh, I, I switch keys. I, I try, unless, I ha unless I'm deliberately making a large scheme of key relationships, which I did you know, in some of the longer pieces in Passion, but if I'm just doing a score of songs, I will, try, I will deliberately write in a key that I haven't written in for a while because you're, I, I write partly at the piano and partly uh, at the, uh, away from the piano, but in the early days, particularly the, um, my first six, eight shows, I would write mostly at the piano, and your fingers fall, your muscle memory gets too, too uh, habituated, and uh, you find yourself writing the same chords and that sort of thing. I'm not very good at keyboard harmony. I never took keyboard harmony. I only took theoretical harmony, and that serves me well, because if I have to make a modulation from C to E flat, uh, somebody who's got keyboard harmony can just uh, glibly, uh, that's both good and bad, get from one to the other in 64 different ways. I have to find my way, and in finding my way, it gets some kind of personal statement, some freshness in it. Uh, it may not be the way other people would do it. And sometimes it's very clumsiness will become part of, 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 of that. But if I want to get from C to E flat in the key of E flat, 
and I write another song in E flat and I want to get from C to E flat, then I'm likely, my fingers are likely to go into the same pl places. So I deliberately will write it in E major or in something. I, uh, when I feel I'm getting stale, I go into sharp keys because they're, they're so foreign and scary. When you were writing something like this, where would you likely have been? Would this have been at the piano, or it could have been either? Uh, this, I, uh, generally, I, generally I, I, I feel my way into an accompaniment figure at the piano. Um, I know in this case, I wanted to use bugle calls through, the, for this is the opening uh, of, of Passion. I wanted to use bugle calls throughout the show, because it takes place mostly in the military post. And a bugle, as you know, is it's just the, the triad. And so I wanted to start that, since it starts with Giorgio, who's an army man, in bed with his mistress. And it has to be a romantic piece, uh, a, a, a post coital piece. And uh, in order to do that and not make it just sound mili military, I, I put in a, a, a dissonant accompaniment in the left hand. But I kept the bugle idea in the right hand, so you get da da bum 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 bum. But it doesn't sound like a bugle exactly, it, but it becomes a, a, a major uh, motif during the whole during the whole show. But I had to find with my fingers, as opposed to my head, some, the dissonant pattern in the in the in the accompaniment uh, in the bass and the left hand. Once I found that, I could then proceed to to write melodically. Uh, 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 about it and against it. What's very interesting here is I see it's an A flat. No, this was an A flat. It's 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 deceptive because it sort of starts with a B flat uh, with an E flat tonality. But uh, yeah, it was, it's an A flat. Um, so that uh, once the accompaniment gets going, I will then start working out the melodic idea. That's generally the pattern. Sometimes a song will start with a melodic idea, but uh, particularly the more uh, pretentiously composed pieces. Start with an accompaniment. When you say pretentiously, I mean well, yeah. Uh, what I mean is ambitious. It's one of the. I, uh, there's uh, pretentious has a pejorative uh, flavor to it, not in my head, uh, but um, uh, and perhaps ambitious. What I mean is extended, extended writing. Uh, a, a passion is composed not so much of songs but of arioso passages that uh, sometimes take song form. The opening is sort of a song form, but it's fairly extended and it's fairly loose and it doesn't, ha it doesn't, the idea of passion for those who don't know is that nothing comes to a conclusion and there's no hand. Musically? Music, yeah. Musically, musically the idea is to make one long rhapsody so the audience will never applaud and so though there are some perfect cadences in it, not very many, um, the audience is never encouraged to, to think that something is over because uh, I didn't want the mood broken with the audience being conscious they were in a theater. In retrospect, do you... Did no, I'm glad I... That's the, that's the, it's right for the piece. It's right for the piece. Applause would be entirely wrong for it. It's just... Uh, uh, the piece is, is really... It, Rhapsody is it, is what it is. And you, it's just... It, it's just wrong. Just wrong. It was always conceived as a long song. Moving on. Moving on. Let's go another show. <laughs> Um, this intrigued me, and I'm just a, a little curious, right here where you have pen alt, mm -hmm. and you have the natural up there and the question mark, any thoughts about what you meant by yeah, some I'd of have to go. I'd have to do, I'll do, with, do this at the piano. Uh, what this is, is is the climax before the end, that's what pen alt means. And this is what I, the harmony I wanted to reach, and I think... Because it's in, as I remember it, it, well, this is written in five flats, but I didn't know whether I wanted an A flat on top or an A natural because it's a B double flat in the bass. And uh, I wanted, I wanted, obviously, I wanted the clash between what looks like, although it's all written in flats, what looks like a B major triad over, uh, over what looks like a, a, a tritone in the bass. A and D flat. And things in parentheses indicate uh, and, uh, opposite. Uh, yeah, uh, no, indicate uh, alternate. Right. Alternate. Everything in parentheses. When, when I hit a chord, and I think it's right, but obviously, for example, in this first chord, I didn't know whether I wanted the C flat in or not. And so I put two D flats as an alternate instead of that, which makes makes for essentially the same sound, but makes it much more of, a, of an F sharp minor chord because 
you could look at that as the first inversion of an F sharp minor chord if you if you read these notes as C sharp F sharp C sharp A C sharp A and I suspect that I found that because uh, I, obviously I didn't want it to end that's why it says penultimate I didn't want it to feel as if it really reached a cadence but uh, I suspect I, I settled for that I'd have to look at the manuscript I, I suspect I did not settle for something quite so bare would you, then, if you were working on this away from the piano, would you then take it to the piano to make the decision? Is you that, got it exactly. Okay. I don't trust my right. ear. I don't trust my ear. But usually, when it comes, but to that is trusting your ear. Well, all right. Well, no, but uh, but to check it at the piano and say, oh no, that's not okay. what I meant. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but most chordal stuff, I work out at the piano. I, I I often will work out if if I have a chord and a chord and I want to work out some contrapuntal passage, I might work uh, on the couch. I work on a on a couch, I will lie down when I write, and I will work it out on the couch and then go to the piano and check it. But if I'm looking for the chordal structures, I'll generally do that with my fingers at the piano. The red arrows every once in a while. That means what I like. <laughs> well, you, as you'll see, there are a lot of there are a lot of pages here of the accompaniment figures, a lot of pages, and. After I've written down as many ideas as, and I'm, I feel I'm, I'm ready to, to give birth, I'll go back over it and decide what it is that I really want to remember and try to preserve. For example, here is what I used. I mean, this becomes this is the basis of the piece. Mm -hmm. I didn't need a red arrow for that because I knew that was the basis of the piece, and these are merely variations on it. But here I had another idea, and I wanted to be sure that I considered that idea as I looked for the at same it, moment. No, well, for the same piece. For, for Clara okay. Georgia one, another place in it. It looks to me, from looking at it now, as if I never used this. But obviously, of all the alternates, this was one of the ones that intrigued me the most. And would you have gone back after you'd done all the sketching and you were playing things through? Is that when you yeah. would have arrowed well, it? Well, when, when, when a section, let's say, when I think I've exhausted the possibilities, at least for that moment, of uh, a, a set of ideas, and I don't want to bore the listener, then I will look through and see, because all of these are related to each mm -hmm. other, either harmonically or in terms of melodic outline or in terms of rhythm. And so it isn't like it's an idea for another song. It came out of the same network of ideas. Mm -hmm. But uh, it does offer contrast and variety. The trick always in, well, in any art, I guess, and particularly in any art that, that, that takes place over a period of time, is how, how do you give it variety and yet make it hold together? You know, how do you prevent it from being a, a, a stri an add a pearl necklace at the same time? Uh, you don't want it just repeat ideas. It's the whole business of long line development. Has it become thing. any easier? I recognize the dangers of boredom more now than I did at the beginning. I recognize the dangers of with repetition. An no, 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 with my, with, 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 I can't judge, you know. Okay. A, a lot of people who, who complain that, m that the music is difficult or something like that, it's because it does tend to change. I, it's something I picked up partly from Cole Porter and partly from Leonard Bernstein. One of the things about Lenny's music that I like is, particularly rhythmically, he keeps surprising just when you think something is going to be a three-four bar it turns out to be a four-four bar, or when you think it's going to be a four-measure phrase, it turns out to be a three-measure phrase. So you really get a chance to get ahead of him, and that keeps the music fresh because it's full of surprises. He used, and he, it's not his phrase, but he, he's, he's the first person I heard it from, that you know music should be inevitable but fresh. And when you listen to Jerome Kern, you know exactly. When you listen to Cole Porter, anybody who studies a Cole Porter song is due for a lot of surprises because what looks like a simple A, A, B, A form, it turns out it's really A, A prime, B, A double prime. He does not repeat the A sections. It's almost, but not quite. And the result is the ear is constantly fresh. And that's what keeps music fresh over a period of time. People who like my music and say they discover new things in it the more they listen to it, it's because there are these little surprises scattered through so that what is jolting on first hearing becomes, you start to see more and what, how it's part of a pattern on second hearing, even if it's not a conscious process. But Porter wouldn't do it through the rhythmic things that Lenny would. No, Porter did it melodically and harmonically. I mean, you look at just one of those things and see the tiny variations. And yet, it's so close to the standard form that it could become popular. But um, he's the great experimenter from that point of view. Kern is the great harmonic experimenter just from harmony. Porter, it's really in terms of melodic line and how he keeps spinning it out with tiny variations. And of course, for harmonic sophistication. And Lenny, I, Lenny has a lot of harmonic surprise, but primarily the thing that surprised you is rhythmic 
structures, I think. Would you talk to him actively about that, or you just no, noticed No, no, I just, just noticed okay. And you, you actually did write long line there. Yeah. Uh, well, what, I'm, what I did was these two chords represent the entire progression of this passage. And so it's the spinning out of this particular, these two, that's, they're written as whole notes, but that that's, the, means nothing. I write long line stuff in either whole notes or half notes to, to show how, the, how the, the move, a whole note could represent four bars, eight bars, 12 bars, 16 bars. And uh, the half note underneath means, uh, let's say you have a C on the top, means there's the C-ness of it on top. I'm sounding like Lenny. <laughs> uh, there's the C-ness on top, but then there's a G and an F, which means that for the first couple of bars, it'll be a, a, have G as a, as a tonal center, next F as a tonal center. And to be able to visualize that is a great help when you're writing extended pieces as opposed to a song form, which, as I say, is A-A-B-A. I rarely use long line stuff when I'm just writing a 32-bar song. Although there is an aspect of that, I know in a song called Too Many Mornings I did that. But that's a longish song. But usually I don't bother. But if I'm writing extended passages like this, and most of the stuff in Passion is extended, then to hold it together, the glue has to be harmonic and has to be spinning out the triad and spinning out the harmonic. But the reason you would actually write that there is... Is to remind myself where I'm going. <laughs> okay. Well, one, one of the things I loved about when I went to the Library of Congress and saw a Gershwin sketch for uh, the trio at the end of Porgy was he knew where he was going and he would just put little thumbtacks all along the, the way to remind himself, I, okay, I've got to reach the C major chord over here, and he's spinning out the melodic line, and then he think, I'll, I'll fill in the harmony later. I won't, I won't worry about how I get from here to here. I just want to be sure that I get there. That's, in a sense, what these are. When these are bedposts. Or thumb, Oscar used to talk about, Oscar Hammerstein used to talk about thumbtacks uh, in terms of lyric writing, of laying out the carpet and then putting that, and then you put in the other tacks along here. But here's point A, here's point B, here's point C. Now we'll fill in. But he always was one. You can see it in his lyrics. They develop like little plays because of that. And you can see that there's an, it's not just repetition. There's a development. He gets from point A to B to C. And I'm not talking about in terms of dramatic action. I'm talking about in terms of idea. And the same thing, I thought, well, why not do that musically, too? And then when I studied with Milton Babbitt, I found out that there's a nice tradition dating back to Mozart that, 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 that spins things out that way. But when you start spinning out the melody, as you said, do you ever get to a point and then realize because of what the melody's done that you want to change that thumbtack? That Usually what happens is that I've worked on it so much that the unconscious takes over and I've hit, I, I arrive where I want to arrive. Uh, I'm sure there are times when, of course, I bend it. I'm not rigid about it and realize that the melody itself will imply something. But since I'm somebody who believes that the heart of music is harmony as opposed to melody, uh, it's very important for me to, to have the sense of, of, of where, where the harmonies are going. And the harmonies imply the melody. And quite often the long line will turn out to be of melodic value. You know, that's, that's also... Sometimes I will take... Uh, I'm sure at a cer certain point I took this opening distance, the da-da-da-da-da-da, and the, and, the, and, the, and the lower voice, and used that as... because what's implied here is you have an E-flat tonality in the, in the left hand and a C major tonality in the right hand. And I'm sure I used that juxtaposition throughout, even if it's not C major and E flat, but that relationship. And the E flat isn't entirely resolved because it's got an unresolved fourth in it. And to use that, so again, it will hold the piece together. What interested me here, um, it looked like you filled in measure 15A and 15B that you would erase. Originally yeah. it was one measure or something, and I was just wondering, the breadth of something, how you decide the amount of time that something needs, what for, for the I have an or... instinct, and I may be entirely wrong, but it, 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 this may not be accurate, but it's true, uh, that Lapine said to me when he heard this, I would like to have a little more time there. Not necessarily for staging, but for, for emotional time. Because this looks to me like we're squeezing later. However, it may be that I just decided that I didn't want to go from that point, from the beginning of bar, uh, what would have been 16 to that, so quickly. It just may be that. There's this whole thing. I, w I wanted so much to get um, that post-coital sense of relaxation. And that means that there should be pauses, at least in this game. I mean, everybody has a different way of dealing with the, that moment. But uh, in this case, I wanted her to be both a little coy with him, and at the same time, she's relaxing. The, the balloon is deflating. And that meant that I put in little passages of rest that 
ordinarily I wouldn't do. I would probably keep this stuff going if it was just a, a ballad. But being a, a post-sex ballad, I wanted to give the, those places where she would just breathe. I do, there was some place in this opening number where Lapine asked for more time, and I think it's later on. But I think this is, this is because what, this is only the 16th bar, and, 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 and the music starts with an orgasm on the bar, whatever it is. And so there, she's only been singing four bars here. And I just didn't want it to go on so quickly. That's why that's there. And I think what happened was I played it over and I thought, no, no, it, she needs more breathing space here. You're so explicit there. Do, do you ever wonder about, in future productions, that the actors are aware of what the, some of the intentions were behind these things? No, well, I wish they would be. I had, a, I had a nice experience when we were doing Sweeney Todd in, um, in London, uh, in Declan Donnellan's production uh, at, at the National Theatre. And uh, Alan Armstrong, who played Sweeney, I was rehearsing him and the uh, quintet in the letter writing scene. And I worked out when he dipped the pen in the thing, and when he wrote, and when he signed, and when he grunted, and when he, when he giggled, and all of that, to go with the quintet singing, because I work out everything in, in, in detail. And he, he was, he's an aggressive fellow, and he actually turned and he said, you mean you thought these things out when you were writing this down? He thought that that was improv that kind of stuff when you dip a quill pen in, is worked out during rehearsals. I said, yes, of course. Every single, every single dip. Now, the director may change this, but I know exactly when I want him to dip the pen in and when I want, it, want him to, to cross out a word or repeat a word or say, you know, there are moments in, the, in that quintet where he writes a word and then he thinks and he, and, he, and he kind of slavers over the word because he likes it so much because it's going to draw the judge into his trap. That's all worked out. And I don't know uh, what a director who doesn't know this will tell an actor, why does he repeat that word? I know why he repeats it. Do you write it down anywhere? Well, there's no way to do that. Or... Well, I, actually, I do write stage directions. I think probably on that one, I, I said something like, he muses or something like that. But you can't. It's, you have to be around. So, yes, the answer is, I work out all these things in detail. And it really, it comes from, it's a knee-jerk reaction from Jerome Robbins when we were writing West Side Story. And I played him Maria. Lenny was uh, off someplace, and I, I, I was the one who played it for him. And he said, well, what do you see happening on the stage? I said, well, Tony is singing this love song to him. Well, what's, what's he doing? So Jerry's starting to get, you know, good stuff. And I said, well, I mean, it's, uh, he's singing. He's full of a He said, you stage it. And we started talking. And he, I learned from that moment that it is of great value to a director to stage within an inch of its life every song you write. Then they can use that as a blueprint and depart from it entirely. But they have something to go from. And um, so I, I, I stage everything. And I tell my collaborating director what I intend, but he doesn't, and often won't, uh, pay any attention to. I worked out the whole opening of the second act of Sweeney, uh, which is uh, the, 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 the so-called beer garden scene where Mrs. Lovett is serving 27 people at once. I worked out what each customer, the one that was overpaying, the one that was underpaying, the one that was drunk, the one that was a glutton, etc., etc. And I had them at different tables. And Hal said, I think it'd be, but I worked it all out, but Hal said, I think it'd be much better if they're all at one table. So my basic scheme, Hal completely changed, but the details are still there for him to tell the actors. I may have had the, uh, the, the guy who's sneak, sneaking away without uh, trying not, not to pay at that table, which I did while Mrs. Lovett's back is turned over here, and I have him trying to sneak out, and Tobias catches him. Hal had him all at one table. Hal had to work out how, 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 how he could sneak out or try to sneak out, because at a big table, everybody sees everybody. So it's not so easy to work out. But he wanted a big table because he wanted that sense of Dickensian stomping. When it was done in the revival at, um, at the... Uh, Circle in the square, there were different little tables, and, and uh, that, was, uh, that was the way I intended it. Uh, Hal's had much more kind of vigor, but this was had much more detail in it. Did you ever change the score because of the, did he need more or less time? Or no, that sometimes that does happen in revivals. Um, I'm trying to think when that happened. Uh, just recently, and I can't think of when it was, somebody said, could I get some more bars here? And I said, absolutely, and I cannot remember what it was. Okay. Oh, I know. It was the concert version of Into the Woods. We needed more time to get people on the stage. That was what it was. So I, I allowed extra bands. This is probably the only show I'm going to remember any detail about at all, but I'm surprised. <laughs> I'm glad we're starting. I'm surprised, I'm surprised I'm remembering even these. This is a, a very simple question. I was just curious. Um, and we're looking at um, 
Giorgio Clara number two. Mm -hmm. And the original, presumably, version, you just have it opening with Christ instead mm -hmm. of God. And I'm just wondering what kind of decision making would make you go from one to the other? Not that they're not close. Well, what does it end up with? Did it end up with Christ or God? It ended up with God. Yeah. I love the word Christ. I love the sound of it. And it's, it, it seems to be more agonizing. God, you are so beautiful, has a, has a kind of sentimental feeling to it. Christ, you are so beautiful, is a, has a sense of shock. Christ is a shocking word. I prefer Christ, and my guess is that Lapine persuaded me to, to change it, I, not to make him a villain or anything like that. It also has to do, of course, God can be extended as a note, and Christ cannot. Uh, and because uh, uh, you can't go Christ, it loses all its yeah. value. But you can go God, because you, you can sing a love song with that, with that single word. And um, so I can't tell you what the reason was. It may have been Lapine, or I may have heard this sung and thought, it's, it's a little too shocking, because it's a word that shocks people. Um, to say God on the stage 40 years ago was a shock. Now it's not such a shock. To say Christ still is a shock, it's, it's really, to quote, taking the Lord's name in vain. And I'm not just talking about the, the Christians in the audience. It just has that feeling. It's a real, you know. But my understanding, with passion, you, the whole fact of the, Italy being a Catholic country. I didn't think of even that. Poor, oh, okay. But of course, but, I mean, James, we talked a lot about that. Uh, but uh, and, and so it's conceivable he wouldn't have said God. I don't know what, what the Italian word would be that would say, because, you know, God, when you say, God, it's hot outside, you, you're not really, it's not, but if you say, Christ, it's hot outside, it's, that's got real force. And um, so I just wanted, I wanted one of those expletives that isn't an expletive, you know.